gentlemen, welcome back to the shop. Today, a treat especial. We are looking at one of, let's get this in focus. We are looking at one of my favorite electromechanical relays of all time. This thing is amazing. This is the GE IAC combined time and instantaneous overcurrent relay. GE's been making the same relay for over a hundred years straight. Like they still produce this exact same relay. They've got a couple models that slowly get uh, mothballed. They're not producing some of the old models anymore, but this exact electromechanical relay you can buy new from GE from the factory to maintain compliance if you're a power plant or somebody that you know still has to still has to maintain a fleet of these old electromechanical relays. Um, there's a lot of really cool functions, a lot of really cool features on these. I I really enjoy working with them. They seem to last forever if you take care of them and you get them calibrated every uh, you know 12 to 24 months. They seem to last absolutely forever. They're really cool. I'm gonna zoom in. You won't be looking at my face. I'm gonna zoom in and we're gonna take a look at some of the the really cool features and then. We're going to test it. I'm gonna test it exactly as I would. You're gonna watch over my shoulder. This video got a lot longer than I was planning on, uh, so I'm gonna have to break it into two chunks. So the first part, part one, which uh, you're watching right now, is gonna be everything on the physical construction, how it works, what it's supposed to do, uh, and just some really important details about the relay. Part two is gonna be the masterclass on testing. So all of the functions of it, uh, how to test it per the manual and per the NITA MTS. Uh, it's gonna have everything you need to know there. So if you are only interested in testing, and you're pretty familiar with the relay and how it works, uh, skip to the next video, I'll link to it whenever I upload it. Uh, that'll be, testing will be in part two. On with the video. This is a GE IAC, you can see here. Uh, part number is 12 IAC 53B. Um, we can look in the manual and see more specifically what all that means. We've got our uh, time unit over here on the side. This is actually the, the ceiling unit that tells us that it has tripped. This is the instantaneous unit that <laughs> tells us it's tripped on instantaneous, go figure. Uh, we can see very, very barely, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit for you guys on here can very barely see that there is a disc in here and inside. You know what? Let's take this out of the case to get a closer look. So when you come up to one in the field, it's going to be in a case like this. One of the first inspections that we need to do. You won't be able to do this if you're working on one in a switch gear, but on my bench makes it a little bit easier. We need to visually inspect the case to make sure that it's in good shape. Part of that is taking a look at the features inside the case. So this little guy right here uh, is actually a safety. It keeps you from putting the lid on or from putting the, the cover on if this service paddles out. And we'll see what that does in just a second. We can see we've got a nice uh, weather seal gasket all along, all along here. That needs, needs to be in good shape. There's some foam that's come off, whatever. And then one last feature that I want to show you on the front of this, this little guy right here is actually the target reset. So that tab right here moves this little arm up. And so if it has tripped on either time or instantaneous, this arm hits this rod right here, which resets the targets. So that is that, just so you know, in my case, is falling apart, so there's fuzz everywhere. If we look around on the back of the case, obviously we see a big grounding stud right here. Um, terminals one, two, and three. Terminals two and three are, have this shorting bar right here. And we'll talk about that in a second when we go to the wiring diagram, but this would be where your uh, trips are hooked up to. So one of these is your time over current trip, one of them is your instantaneous trip. And they short them together so that you have a common, either one to two or one to three is sort of a common trip that will both trip the breaker. And we'll see there's no stud. I'm not sure if you guys are gonna be able to see that on camera. There's number four. There is no stud on number four. Again, we'll get to that in a second. Five and six are where the CTs will be hooked up. Up front, once we've got the cover off, we can pull the 
service paddle out. You just get a little bit of a corrosion on this. Um, normally what I'll do in the field is if, if I, I see them in this sort of condition, I'll take just a tiny little bit of scotch Brite and clean them up uh, just to take the oxide layer off. So obviously a little bit of oxide layer is gonna create some, some heat. It's not the best uh, connection for your trip in your CT circuit. Um, if you go a little bit too crazy with it or there's a really old one that's been maintained a lot um, and you accidentally go through the, the tinning or the silver layer and you get down into the copper, you would wanna put some Noox on that. I generally don't put grease on these or Noox or anything like that uh, unless you absolutely have to. If they're in this condition, a little bit of scotch Brite will clean it right up and we'll take a look at that later. These two little locking tabs, you got one on the top, one on the bottom. Unlock it from the case and the whole thing just slides out the front. A couple things we'll wanna look at in the case. All right, so we can see in the case here, terminals one, two, and three come up to little lands right here. Again, that's for our trip circuit. And then terminals five and terminal six, if we can see way back in there, it might not be in focus or anything, but there's actually a shorting tab. So there's a little piece of copper in here that's spring-loaded. So as soon as you take, as soon as you take the service paddle out, these aren't being pushed down anymore, and they'll spring up and it will actually short pins five and six of the case together so that we don't open circuit RCTs and potentially damage our CT circuits when we take the relay out of service. The guts of the GE IAC, if we look at the back, hey look at that, instead of five terminals we've got six. So I've got terminal uh, one, two, and three, these are part of the trip circuit. Terminal four is actually part of the CT circuit and I'll talk about that in a second. Five and six are where you would normally connect your CT to have the relay essentially detect if there's a overcurrent going on. We can also see from the back, this one's fairly open, there's our disc. This is the, the motor that drives the induction disc for our induction time overcurrent unit. Flip around here. This is the disc. It should rotate freely. We always want to make sure that it actually does rotate. This one's been marked with a Sharpie. You don't always see that, but that's fairly common, especially on older ones. Here we've got our tap selection, tap selection row up top. I want to get that in nice focus for you. See this row up top? We've got some numbers on it. These are, this is our tap selection. Obviously this wire comes right off of our CT terminal, off of the back or out of the case, and then it connects to all of these wires. So this one comes up. If you need to change the tap that this is on, change the pickup, we would just loosen this screw and then move it to the corresponding tap on the transformer in the back, and that changes the amount of current required to get the disc to start spinning. Getting the disc to start spinning is essentially what we call our pickup. Um, and then we've got our actual time function. The way that that works is once we have more current than our tap setting, the disc will begin to rotate. And I'll zoom in as much as I can. This one's a little bit schmooed up, so it is kind of hard to see, but as the disc rotates, this contact rotates as well. And when it comes all the way around, it will close and touch this contact. This contact is also a little bit spring-loaded, should have about a, a 30 second to about a 16th of spring travel on that little leaf spring right there. Do that to keep the contacts from easily welding and, and sticking to each other. So this is part of our trip circuit. So we've got current in our trip circuit that would, when it's closed, that will allow current to flow through this coil, our, our seal-in coil. And then that will pick up those contacts right here and hold the seal-in contact keeping the, the trip circuit energized until the breaker fully opens and trips and, and uh, ceases the current. Now, in parallel with that, we also have the instantaneous unit. 
The instantaneous unit is a little bit dumber. This one, I say dumber, a little bit more simple. It is just a solenoid. That's pretty much it. You change the pickup by moving, take this little lock ring off, loosen that little lock ring off, and we'll tighten or loosen this screw. It's essentially just a bolt. And that will change the amount of magnetic flux that it takes to pick up the solenoid and close the instantaneous trip contacts. Now those two contacts are the seal in for the, the time over current element and the contact for the instantaneous trip element are essentially just in parallel and that's why we have them tied together on the back of the case. So that is the majority of the guts of it. Um, everything is adjustable. If we need to adjust our taps or our, our pickup, the amount of current that it starts rotating at, We'll loosen off this little nut right here. Let's see if I can get that in focus. I will loosen off that little nut and I can slide the drag magnet. This big unit right here, it's kind of hidden by the nameplate, but this unit here is called the drag magnet and that slows down the rotation of the disc. And so having it further out requires more torque from the, essentially the motor, the time over current unit. Uh, it requires more torque, meaning more current. If I bring it back into the disc, it requires less torque to spin, so we can adjust our, uh, adjust our pickup value to get it within range of our, our tap setting. And then if our time dial's off, oh, another quick note on this. When you're setting these up, or if you're changing settings for the first time, or you just, it's really far out of calibration, you need to figure out what's going on. Uh, a quick check, we will set our time dial. This is the, the setting that tells us the characteristic of the trip. So this, this changes the, the slope of the curve that it will trip on. And we'll get to that more in a second. If we bring our time dial setting all the way down to zero, and you can see those little dials are numbered. If we bring our time dial setting all the way down to zero, our disc, or our, our rotating contact, should just barely touch. If it just barely touches and it still has a little bit of wiggle room on that leaf spring for the, the stationary contact, I don't know if you guys are gonna be able to see that at all. If those are just barely touching, that should be adjusted right. This is sort of our, our base calibration. And if that's not right, we can actually loosen a couple more things off and uh, adjust them, that would actually be this adjustment screw right here. You'll loosen that off and then push this one way or the other and then tighten it back up. Typically, we don't have to deal with that. Um, there are other ways to get our time curve dialed in right, but if you're struggling and it's really far off, uh, that's how you would adjust that. Okay, so if our timing is a little bit off, obviously this whole unit balances on a needle bearing, which is way down here in the bottom. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get a good picture of that. I might put a still of it up on here. Way down here at the bottom, uh, there's a little needle bearing and a jewel, and that should be clean and dry, and it should last a very, very, very long time. But occasionally you do get dust and corrosion and schmoo in there, and they stop working. Um, very seldom do you have to actually take this screw out and remove that and clean it. It does happen. Uh, they do get, <laughs> obviously if this is a hundred year old relay, you'd probably have to take that apart and clean it as uh, part of your PM procedure, but it's just something to be aware of. If that's rotating correctly and everything's, you know, it's rotating, it's resetting, and our timing just isn't quite right, there's a little crown nut. Obviously we can see some indentations along this ring right here just above this clockwork spring the copper part so clockwork spring that is actually what resets this that gives it the the, the tension to reset the disc obviously we can see that moving a little bit it takes a while we can either increase or decrease the tension on that spring which will affect our time over current curve it'll it will obviously uh, turning it to the right will increase the tension, which will 
increase the time that it takes to trip. Decreasing the tension turning this to the left would decrease that time to trip. So how would we adjust that if we needed to? Well, take your handy dandy screwdriver and just stick it in one of these slots. And what I find is if you put it up at an angle and sort of turn it like you're turning a screw, it engages a little bit better and it's easier to turn without slipping off and busting anything. But we will get to that shortly. Because this is fully electromagnetic, the whole thing functions on a magnet that's literally right here. The big metal heavy case is part of the magnetic circuit. So calibrating out of the case might mean that it's not calibrated correctly once we put it in the case. So how do we accomplish that? Well, either you'd have a spare case or ideally you would have a test paddle like this. This slides into the case and now I have test connections. So ideally we're gonna test this into the case that it's gonna be in in service. But remember what I said, when I pull my service paddle out, it open circuits the CT, which is why we have that little uh, CT shorting block in there. Well, if I push this or this test paddle in, if I push this test paddle in, I now have connections on that CT circuit that are now going to be interrupting that uh, CT circuit, right? So if you get a good set of test paddles, they should come with these little shorting arms, and you'll need to be very, very careful, quadruple check every time, when you go to set this up, you gotta make sure you've got this shorting arm or this shorting bar connected anywhere that you've got a CT circuit. So in my case, it's five to six. If we look at that, one, two, three, four, terminal five and terminal six. Now I have this shorting bar, so I've got a path for the current for my CTs to go to. Now I'll be able to hook up on the black terminals. So this is where I will connect my test set on these black terminals which go to the top of the test paddle, which obviously go to the relay when it's in service. The bottom is on the red bottom terminals. It's on these bottom nuts. So the some relays have, uh, they're a little bit higher and they'll have a separate service panel on top and bottom if they need more than 10 connections. So make sure that you're, uh, if we're on terminals one through 10, those numbers are right side up. And if we are, upside down on a case, like a double height case. Uh, obviously, terminals 11 through 20, the case side will be red, but that'll be on top. And 11 through 20, um, it, just, it works upside down. So if you're going on the top service paddle slot, red is on top. On the bottom, red is on bottom. Obviously, in this case, I've only got one, so I'm only using terminals one through 10. And you can pick these up on eBay. That's where I got this one. Um, came with a, a whole set, so it had a whole bunch of uh, shorting pins and stuff like that. I don't know if they make these new anymore. I believe you are probably be able to find one new. Okay, uh, with all of that said, let's take a look at how we get set up and actually push some current into this and test it to verify that it's working. RTFM, read the fucking manual. In this case, it's a lot easier than it sounds. Um, because, I mean, if we take a look at this guy, it's only 16 pages. These old electromechanical relays, like I said, it, it's single phase, there's no software, there's no nothing crazy going on, but you have to read the manual to know what you need to do for this. So there is a couple goofy things, obviously we've got uh, our time over current curve. If you don't know how to read time over current curves, I'll link to a video somewhere on screen. Um, I'm assuming if you're watching this, you already know how to read time curves. Uh, and the software, most of the testing software already has these curves built in. Maybe at some point I'll show you how to like make an Excel sheet to solve them. Um, if you're in a real pinch, we've got some really good information. It breaks down tripping time, um, some applications for this relay, some operating characteristics. Really what I'm looking for right here, obviously these are, we've got uh, three single phase or neutral uh, CTs hooked up that shows you how to wire in the entire trip circuit. So stuff like that is really, really handy. Um, this shows just sort of generic 
how the units actually work, stuff like that. So really, really good information. Go ahead and read the whole thing. Like I said, it's only 16 pages. It's not gonna, it's not gonna kill you. Um, most of it's pictures anyway. Uh, this is one of the most important things that we find in these manuals. So every different part number has a different schematic. And the best way to find the schematic is to look at the instruction manual. Now, on the nameplate here, this will tell you which manual corresponds to this specific relay. It might even have a wiring diagram uh, number on it to help you find it, which is fantastic. So we're on the right, uh, we're on the correct manual for this. Obviously this is the uh, G, what do they call this? GEH 1788, that is the document that I found, GEH 1788. Um, you can get that straight from the GE website, I'll probably link to it down in the description just so you can follow along. This is the relay that we're working on, this exact one. This is the IAC 53B. Uh, so this is the, the connection diagram that we want to take a look at. Uh, obviously the first three terminals are our trip circuit. I'm going to zoom in on this so make it easier for you guys to see. Terminal 1, 2, and 3 are our trip circuit. Terminal 1, which correlates to this terminal on the back of the relay or terminal one on the back of the case. Uh, terminal one is the common for our trip circuit. Terminal two is for our seal-in unit. So this is the, the trip output of the induction unit, which is kind of cool. So that goes to terminal two. And then terminal three is the instantaneous trip output, which we saw on the back of the case. Terminals two and three have a little shorting bar together. So either terminal two, the sealing unit, or terminal three, the instantaneous unit closing or tripping will cause a trip circle, uh, trip circuit to close and hopefully open circuit and you know trip the breaker and interrupt the fault. What causes those two to operate? Uh, so our CTs normally would be hooked up on five and six. Again, we only have terminals five and six on the back of the relay. So CTs get hooked up five to six. Polarity doesn't matter, this is a single phase and there's no voltage reference or anything like that, so you can hook it up either way. Above terminal six, so that's this guy right here, above terminal six is the instantaneous unit. Above terminal five, this guy right here, I don't have my pointy finger, is our induction unit, which again goes through the tap, through the coil on the back, which then spins the disc. And so if you've got your CT hooked up on five and six, all 100% of the current has to flow through both the instantaneous unit and the time over current unit. So whichever one is operating, whether it's, it's timing on the, the, the time curve or it's so high it's gonna instantly pick up our instantaneous unit, all of that current is there. We also see there's no second chevron on this one. This is terminal four, this is the the middle point between five and six. If you're using, again, we have to remember these were made up to a hundred years ago, right? The test equipment that we had back then was not fantastic. Engineers that designed this thought ahead and they're like, well, I, I don't want to trip. I don't want to deal with the timing. Oh, my, my test set doesn't have enough VA to output, doesn't have enough energy to output and energize both coils or push through both coils because it can be fairly high impedance. So if you're testing this with an older test set, you could hook up on terminal four here on the back of the relay or terminal four here on your test paddle and you could push from four to five to isolate the time over current element or push from four to six to isolate your instantaneous element. So that's a cool thing. Uh, we don't necessarily have to worry about that so much anymore because our, our test equipment and our software is a little bit better. Uh, obviously the test equipment outputs are a lot more powerful than they used to be. So that's just something to keep in mind. What else do we have in our lovely manual? Obviously more diagrams for different ones. They tell you how the uh, contacts in the case work. Um, they tell you a little bit about the, uh, the target and the ceiling unit. So the ceiling unit is actually kind of interesting because we have two ranges on here and they're just marked. I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to read that. They're marked 0.2 and 2.0. Uh, a lot of electromechanical relays, especially induction disc relays, are gonna have a very similar setting. So trip coils, in breakers have a certain amount of impedance and they take a certain amount of current to, to pull in. 
So if that impedance is fairly low and the current draw is really high, I need my ceiling unit to be able to tolerate that much current flowing through this little coil. So there's actually two separate coils in the ceiling unit. Remember the ceiling, uh, if the time over current disc goes all the way to trip. If the, if the trip is timed out and it needs to trip, the ceiling unit will hold that trip circuit closed essentially until the breaker is open all the way. And then that's also what drops the, the little indicator flag right here. So that's the ceiling unit. Um, so there's two coils inside that ceiling unit. One is for fairly high, uh, high amperage, low impedance trip coils that you'll find in your know, really big old chunky breakers. If it's part of a, a, uh, a different type of circuit, like a, like it's got a lockout relay or something like that, where it's got a decent amount of impedance to it. And if it takes less than two amps through the trip coil or through the lockout relay to trip the breaker, you don't want to have a really high impedance uh, circuit in your sealant relay. So we'll go, we'll have a very low impedance on our ceiling relay, uh, which would be that 0.2 selector. So it's essentially below two amps or above two amps, but they're, they're marked on here as 0.2 and 2.0. If it's above two amps, you go to two. If it's below two amps, you go to 0.2. We don't really think about that too much uh, nowadays because everything runs off you know, high current uh, tripping relays or high current um, MOSFETs in the back of our modern microprocessor based protection relays. So that's not so much of a concern anymore. I mean, it's still a concern. You have to design the whole system to work correctly together, right? But back in the day, having it built into the relay meant that you had fewer parts that were interchangeable between projects. So you would just select, hey, this is a really low impedance uh, trip circuit. So I put it on two or hey, it's a really high impedance trip coil in my breaker. So I put it on 0.2 and that was it. That was the, that was the solution that they came up with however many years ago. Uh, disc and bearings, blah, 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 blah. Acceptance tests. This is really the bulk of what we want to look at. And um, we also need to compare this to what Nita tells us to do, right? So we're going to look at both of those in just a second. Obviously set the relay at, okay. So this, <laughs> These old manuals will tell you to change the settings and then test them at one setting. Um, that was a limitation of the test equipment that we had back then and the documentation and stuff like that. Nowadays, it's pretty much required that you have to test them at the settings that they're going to be in service. So we can't just go around changing all the settings, testing it at some default and then changing them back. Like it's not necessarily the right way to do that. We've got, we've got better software, we've got better hardware. Um, but the, the, the tests themselves are correct, right? So we have to do the main unit, the time over current unit pickup. We have to do the timing and we need to do that per Nita at either two or th at least two points. I always do it at three points. It doesn't take me any more time. Um, on the instantaneous unit, we need to do the pickup. The Nita ATS says I also have to test the dropout, which is not on here. They don't tell you to test the dropout of the instantaneous unit on here. Just be aware of that. And then we also need to test the uh, pickup and the dropout of the ceiling unit. So we will get to that once we've got the test set hooked up. All right, guys, that's it for part one. Uh, be sure to do all the YouTube stuff, like, share, subscribe, all that. And then uh, next week I'm gonna upload part two, which is gonna be everything you need to know to test the relays.